have with us uh, Dr. Dan Abel. Uh, Dan is uh, a part of the faculty at Coastal Carolina. He joined the faculty there in 1994. He's currently Professor of Marine Science. He earned his bachelor's and master's degree uh, from College of Charleston and his PhD in Marine Biology from the University of California, San Diego's Script Institution of Oceanography. He did postdoctoral work in biomedicine, in, excuse me, marine biomedicine at the Medical University of South Carolina. Author of two textbooks on science, uh, environmental science, and his annual Biology of Sharks course held at the Bimini Biological Field Station in Bahamas has run for more than 20 years. He'll have a sign-up list for that right afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds inviting. <laughs> Founder of, uh, founding director of Coastal Carolina's Sustainability Initiative from 2006 to 2012, currently vice chair uh, the Board of Directors of the Dogwood Alliance, a forest protection nonprofit. Areas of expertise, are you ready for this list? Biology of sharks, ecology of sharks, environmental issues, sustainability, land use, pollution, overpopulation, energy consumption, green building, and stingrays. I, I love that <laughs> <laughs> stingrays. He is a native South Carolinian and lives in Pauly's, and we are thrilled to have him here today to speak on bulls, lemons, and sandbars, an overview of the Coastal Carolina University's shark. Shark Project. Join me in welcoming Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. I'm not sure where that bio came from. It's like a positive of several, and a little bit might even be fiction. Uh, thank you for coming out on a Tuesday morning. Uh, it's a scary audience as I look out here, and I say scary because I know a lot of you are fishers and you know a lot more about local sharks than probably I do. And the only group that's scarier to me is second graders because <laughs> they seem to know facts that haven't hit the scientific literature yet. So anyway, if you ask any tough questions, I notice there's an exit. <laughs> uh, so again, the title is Bulls, Lemons, and Sandbars, the CCU Shark Project. Um, that's obviously not Winya Bay there. That's part of my Bimini Biological Field Station annual course with me and, a, and a, about an 11 foot tiger shark that we released and swam happily away afterwards. Both I and the shark swam happily <laughs> uh, A lot of embarrassing pictures of me in today's presentation. I didn't know it was going to be posted someplace, so uh, uh, it'll compound the embarrassment. If you were in Winya Bay a few weeks ago, you may have seen this. We, um, we just did two new Nat Geo Wild documentaries and this is my friend Paul Kenny's boat, uh, and we were longlining for sharks. Uh, first time we were longlining during a period after some heavy rainfall, and it's rare for us to get skunked, but of course with National Geographic on the boat, we got skunked. And that, that's us setting a long line in the bay. I'll tell you all about the project and what we do. This is, this is somewhat of an overview of the talk I'm gonna give. I wanna discuss something called the Summer of the Shark. There was one in 2001, there was one in 2015. What, what is that? Was it the Summer of the Shark? What are sharks in our lives? If we can get any audio today, this is a group that will recognize one of the songs that my undergraduates stare blankly at when I play, and I'll show you why. <laughs> Tell you what a shark is very briefly. <coughs> Why study sharks, and then uh, sharks of South Carolina waters, which basically is an overview of the shark project we've been doing principally in Winya Bay. So that's why I'm particularly delighted to give this talk. I give it all over, but this is George. One of, Winya Bay is one of Georgetown County's real, real natural gems, and so many people don't even know it. And I love to communicate what we do to people uh, in Georgetown, and then talk more about the project, and then studying sharks in, in Bimini, Bahamas. Um, I can get through, I've got a lot of slides. Uh, if you have a burning question you need to interrupt me, please do, otherwise at the end I'll take some questions. So some of the embarrassing pictures. Um, <laughs> this is a Weather Channel interview uh, in, in 2015. Wake up with Al, I was so excited to talk to Al, and Al apparently has nothing to do with wake up with Al. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but this was my first Skyping, and, and my phone was held up 
with a green pepper behind me. <laughs> and, and the most scary thing about it, that, of course, is my eyes. Not <laughs> and then I, did, I just recently, <laughs> I went to Corvallis, Oregon, and they called me. It was 4.30 in the morning, and I did it. So, so my scary interactions with sharks are with the people that want to know about it. <laughs> not with of course, I do have a fan club. <clears throat> See that the dog looking at me. So there's some more embarrassing things I'll tell you about. Later. So summer of 2015. Remember we were calling that the summer of the shark because there were a number of shark bites. We get bites along our coast all the time, and I purposely call them bites and not attacks. Bites are typically mistaken identities, and I'm sure this is old information for many of you. You know that when a shark bites and continues to bite, then we call it an attack. A white shark, perhaps a bull shark, might do that, maybe a tiger. No. But most of the bites we get along our, our coast are bite and release. And unless you're very unfortunate, it, you, you're left with a scar and, and a good story. Um, sometimes it's more serious than that. Um, these are sandbar sharks, so that would, one with me on the left and one of my students on the right. Just a few pictures, there's another sandbar shark in the water putting a tail noose on. You may see our pontoon boat out of Georgetown Harbor. Uh, we bring anything under six feet on board, but if it's bigger than six feet, we work with it off the bow, and that's a student putting a tail noose on, on a, a shark. A few of these are somewhat gruesome pictures. We release almost all of our sharks alive. We kill practically nothing. In fact, we've saved some sharks. We didn't kill this one. You can tell this was a shark on a line. The, the big source of mortality when we study is other sharks eating the sharks that bite our line. So this is a poor sandbar shark that got eaten by a bigger sandbar shark. <laughs> but I do have a picture if anybody wants it, you can email me. Of a, we, we used a small shark as bait, caught a bigger shark, and then a bigger shark ate that. So I saw all three shark, wow. sharks in that photo. Wow. So just more pictures in Winya Bay. Um, there's not much data in here, but I just want to show you a little bit of it. This just shows, this is a bar graph showing what we call the catch per unit effort. So it's just a standard, the number of sharks we cat, catch every time we throw a 50 hook long line in the water. And we get our 25 hook long line. We typically get one to two sharks every time we pull it in. Sometimes we get 20, sometimes we get zero. But if you look at the end, 2015 had slightly more sharks than 2002, which was a big year, if you remember back then that long ago, it was a drug abuse. So we got a lot of sharks then, but not much difference there. You can see the five biggest sharks that we catch. Carcharis lumbatus, which is the black tip shark, the sandbar shark, the Atlantic sharp nose shark, the fine tooth shark, and the bull shark. And this is 2015. And you can see slight differences, especially in the fine tooth and the bull. And I'll talk about those differences a little bit later. And then the only big difference was in 2015, whenever we set a long line with 25 hooks on it, we caught a shark every time. It would have been great if we had when National Geographic would have done this. <laughs> <laughs> the second time we did do this with National Geographic, we caught lots and lots and lots of sharks. In fact, I think they're changing the show that they had planned because we caught so many sharks, they wanted to focus more on us than just do a little snippet of us in a big, bigger show. And then finally, uh, we had changes in the size of the sharks. And so this is just the total length of the sharks. This, so this is, in, this is four meters, so um, about 17 and a half feet long. And you can see that bull sharks were kind of big. The fine tooth were big. Um, the shark nose, not very many of them. And it's not surprising because they get eaten by all these others. So we didn't catch many of them that year. And then that's, you spell it. That's the sandbar shark. And the black tip shark. So I'm going to tell you more about those later. This to me is the scariest beast in the ocean. Huh? <laughs> it's only about that long. Anyone know what it is? See, the second graders would know. <laughs> no, it could be, but it's a cookie cutter shark. I was going to say it was And it's a cookie cutter shark because uh, pound for pound, it, it's just very scary what it does. And it lives in, in you know, in the, uh, several hundred meters deep. When it sees something lurking, something big moving by, and that could be a whale, a dolphin, a seal, sea lion, could be a nuclear submarine. It accelerates towards it really fast, and with that body, it can move fast. 
this is an illustration, incidentally. I'll talk a little bit about it. I got a book coming out in July, and that's my one of my illustrator illustrations from uh, a very famous shark illustrator named Mark Dando. Um, but it accelerates, it sinks its jaw into it, has very fleshy lips, and then will take a cookie cutter plug out of it, a cookie sized plug out of it. Uh, and most of the animals recover from it. And until about three or four years ago, no instances of ever attacking humans, but there have been now two, two isolated accounts. So that's why it's so scary. That's what the teeth look like. You can see all these oh, well, well. multiple rows of teeth. I mean, this is scarier than a white shark to me. Oh my God. And that's what it looks like when they take a, a chunk of, of tissue out. Uh -huh. These are from Opaz and the uh, Hawaii uh, United Fishing Agency auction. Uh, several of these probably were. These fish were on a long line, and this shark came by and took chunks of yellowfin tuna. Big hmm. chunk there. This is a nuclear submarine. You thought I was kidding, but apparently in some of the towed sonar arrays and other parts of nuclear submarines, uh, the Navy was noticing these big marks on them. And they thought, they sent it back to the manufacturer and said, you know, we've got product fatigue or you manufactured it wrong. And finally, they took it to an ichthyologist at Scripps, where I got my graduate degree, one of my advisors, Dick Rosenblatt, and he looked at it and said, it's a cookie cutter shark. So the Navy was, you know, was being attacked, not by the enemies that we know, but by you know, little sharks. Okay, so that's um, the summer of the shark. The, the conclusion is that 2015 was no more a summer of the shark than any other summer. But we're seeing changes. Some of the fishers in the audience have already told me they've seen changes over their lives. So we're going to see a lot more changes not only in the shark fauna, but in everything, terrestrially and in, um, aquatically. Um, but 20, 2015 wasn't summer of the shark. Um, let's talk a little bit now about some sharks in our lives. Whoa. Yeah, this is, this is the group O-Search, and, and they, do, um, they do a lot of work tagging white sharks and, and others, and uh, they've got a very nifty device. They have a ship with a platform on it. And one of the problems with studying big sharks is they're not intended to be taken out of the water. And if you pull them out of the water by a hook, you could do some damage to them, particularly with rays, which are very closely related to sharks. And they generated a lot of enthusiasm for sharks with their app that practically all my students at Coastal Carolina University that like sharks have. I mean, they tagged some of the big white sharks. They, the results have pretty much corroborated something that's already known, that we do have white sharks along our coast. Um, but give them a lot of credit for the, um, the, the, the innovations they've used and for bringing this to the, you know, the attention of the people. They use satellite tags. Um, we don't, in our work, simply because they're too expensive and the research questions we're asking don't require us to use them. Uh, these have to break the surface of the water before they can upload information. They have to stay for a few seconds. Um, and they're quite expensive, a couple of thousand dollars or more each. And what they've produced is some of these tracks. And you can see that sharks have spent some time off our coast. Um, there was a, a controversy early on because I think some of them were actually pinging uh, on Daniel Island, in top of Charleston, uh, actually on the island. And they, they weren't there. Um, and sharks, just the inaccuracies of some of the satellite positioning systems, or maybe maybe it was close to, to Daniel Island. But they do, we do get white sharks, and they do get close to our shoreline. There's more more tracks. Mary Lee is the one that most people will know by name. So this is the shark. This is the the song I thought that many of you might know. Oh, sure. Yeah, we can hear it. We can hear it loud enough, I think. Yeah. So. Um, I show this to my students and play it for them, and one or two of them have heard it. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, and is this, is this song about a shark? Anyone know? It's from Three Penny Opera. Yeah, it's, it's about a hitman. Yeah. <laughs> with the, the, the knack the knife. About, the, it's simply about a shark. Um, sharks and fine art. I hope some of you have been lucky enough to see these. These are um, um, two of my favorites. Um, Jonathan Copley's Watson and the Shark. And you can see here, this is the shark, it's a tiger shark. This occurred, it was based on an actual event that occurred in Havana Harbor in the 17, late 1700s. Um, and the shark took the leg off of, of um, Watson. Um, he recovered when he became Lord Mayor of London. Um, and then this scary one, Winslow, Winslow Homer's with, you know, water spots in the distance and 
this person lashed to the sail of a <coughs> sailboat with these hungry sharks swimming around it. But they both depict sharks as, in ways that are frightening to people, which is one of the reasons we, we like sharks so much, really. Um, again, most of my students, I'll refer to them frequently. I, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm here because of my students, but um, they have some interesting differences from people in our generations. And one of them is they don't read as much. And so, um, you know, they, marine science majors who haven't read Old Man in the Sea is, is, is a bit shocking to me. But, but a big shark features prominently in this. Um, they may know this one better. <laughs> Sharkini. And then, you know, one of the funny things, I'm going to move to the next slide so you don't have to listen to that. But, um, there are, in some years, there seem to be more interactions with sharks. I mean, like shark bites along parts of the coastline. And the explanations I always hear, one of the explanations are more people interacting with these animals. So even if the shark population is the same, more people are in the water. But that's not my experience. If you go to the beach, you see a lot more people on the beach. I still think Jaws has scared people from going in the water. And so we don't see nearly as many people swimming as we do hanging out on the beach. Lots of other shark-themed movies. Um, Here's a summer of the shark from 2001. I hesitate to show this, but this is because 2001 in the summer was a slow news year. <laughs> yeah, until, what, 9-11, and then, then the things changed for all of us. Um, but again, there were a couple of fatalities, and so these things happened, um, unfortunately, and I don't want to be flippant about it, but it was probably, again, no more a summer of the shark. This was a summer of the uh, marketers trying to sell magazines, basically. What's funny is people die hourly in car accidents, but we all keep driving. Oh, I'm going to give you some more examples of how we we'll talk, start talking about shark bites. Yeah, I've got, I've got tons of them. Um, so this is the tabloids. You probably, I'm not sure if these even exist anymore, but I think they, but I, I like the one, I, I show these to my students because I ate the shark that ate my wife. <laughs> 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 but I ask them, what, I say, what's wrong with that? And they say, well, that's terrible because you're eating your wife. I said, well, no, that's not what I want. You're a biologist. Why is, well, it's not a shark. That's like a, a river catfish, a big, maybe a Mekong catfish. <laughs> <laughs> One of the dead giveaways is that terminal mouth, the mouth that's at the tip rather than uh, under slung. And then this was in the news a while back. Says so uh, Malaysian fisherman reels in shark with web feet. This poor woman was so frightened by that that experience that she she thought it was a bad omen and she returned to the fisher. But this is the male shark, and the male shark has claspers that they insert into the female and they transfer sperm. And in order, you can imagine doing that while animals are swimming is quite difficult. So they have a series of hooks and spurs and spines to anchor themselves into the female. They rotate it 180 degrees, and, that, and when an animal dies, sometimes they will splay out like that. So it's not the missing link that the Malaysian paper <laughs> uh, I won't have time to talk much about this, but if you're interested, we you know, can ask questions later. But um, a long time ago, uh, uh, an episode aired on 60 Minutes, mm -hmm. talking about a uh, miraculous cure for uh, testicular cancer in Cuba using shark cartilage. And it turns out that it's, shark cartilage has properties that are anti-cancer, but lots of natural products are anti-cancer. Um, basically, shark cartilage will keep blood vessels from growing. Cancerous tumors need blood vessels from growing. It turns out that, that millions of sharks were killed. You can still buy bottles of shark cartilage. It's ineffective in, in, in treating cancers, although one of the can cancer, current uh, cancer Treatments does involve using that same principle called the anti-angiogenesis, but not using shark cartilage. And I like this one because none of you would fall for this now. We're not, you know, we're so... I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this, when I first got to Coastal Carolina in, in the mid-90s, in, in the infancy of the internet, a student brought that to me and said, my mother got this off the internet. And here's where, you know, you would find this incredulous. She looked at me and then she said, I, I said, that's not real. She said, no, it is. It came from the internet. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But 
photoshopping that is quite 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 easily done yeah. <laughs> I, I can tell you a little bit about my life with sharks. I grew up in South Carolina low country fishing for uh, sharks like many of you have done and then moved to the west coast and began studying them for my dissertation. This is the Scripps Pier from a view from my office. And SeaWorld was kind enough to help us. Um, they wanted us to understand why they couldn't keep white sharks alive and in return they would they paid for my research. So we'd go off the San Diego coast about 10 miles, throw a bucket of chum at it, so finally chopped up mackerel in a burlap bag that was frozen as it thawed, it would come out the bag. Um, you can see the little pieces there. It has what's called an odor corridor. Sharks have very acute senses of smell and they can then follow it. This is a blue shark, the head and the tail and the dorsal fin right there. We would scoop them up or throw a hook out bring them, put them in, uh, in a, in a uh, box for traveling, run some water over their gills, move them back and forth. Um, sharks need, most sharks need to keep moving. If they don't move, the blood will pool. It's not returned to the heart. This is a blue shark on an operating table. My advisor, one of my advisors was a, was a world famous uh, cardiologist on the right. And we were under, trying to understand heart function in this group of fishes. Uh, this animal gave birth to about 30 baby blue sharks that mm. came out perfectly formed, snapping, and we were able to return them to the water. And that's one of the life history strategies of sharks that makes them vulnerable to being overfished and to other human threats is that uh, they, most of them, or many of them, retain their young until they're an advanced age. And so when they're born, um, they're capable of fending for themselves. And so these miniature sharks came out and were, you know, they were, many of them would survive. So um, the whole hose in the mouth is ventilating its gills. Um, and then we were measuring its electrocardiogram and studying its pericardium. Another thing that we did back in, in the early days of my uh, graduate school was to look at uh, the metabolic rate of mako sharks. Now, metabolic rate is just an indicator of how, how it's using energy, how much oxygen it's taking in. And it's important if you're going to understand a species, any species that's being fished, understand how much it needs, how much energy it needs, how, many, how much it eats. Um, but this animal is particularly difficult to study. And so what we did, we, we, we caught one uh, off of one of the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration vessels, the David Star Jordan and put it in basically a water treadmill. This is a, a flume, water moves past it, the animal swims in it, and we can then measure how much oxygen it uses, which is a proxy for how much it needs to eat, how much energy is expended. To the side, that's me back in my hair days. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a mako swimming in, swimming in that chamber. So, the last thing before I really get to some of the serious parts of the talk, um, people always ask me if I've ever been bitten by a shark. And the answer is yes, several times. And this is one of the first bites. Um, I'll show you, uh, I'm not going to show you the bite. Um, but that's the dead white shark. And uh, I survived the bite uh, basically because the animal was dead already when it bit me. I, this, this, this was a. a about a 17 foot, 2100 pound animal that SeaWorld had bought from somebody. Um, they cleaned it up and preserved it, uh, froze it, and it toured at all the different SeaWorlds. So if you're ever at SeaWorld in the 80s, you might have seen this one. Uh, they had armed guards around. They took this picture um, in, a, in like a, a briefcase with my camera in it. In the days before, there was um, in digital photography and was able to get a, one picture of it. But I'd always heard white shark teeth were sharp, so I ran my finger across it, and <laughs> sure enough, I got bit. That really wasn't a shark's fault. <laughs> I'll show you one in a minute, that really wasn't a shark's fault. Um, this, there's another one, too, also, that I'm going to show you. This, if, if gruesome um, scenes bother you, you might want to turn your eyes, because this is a real bite that I had. <laughs> I, was feeding, I was feeding a baby lemon shark in the Bahamas, with a camera in one hand and food in the other, and I was focusing on the camera and it clicked down on my thumb and caused this really oh. bad stress fracture. <laughs> oh. This was another bite. Um, this bite was um, when I rubbed my 
finger against the skin of a shark. We call it shark burn, but it's technically a bite because I'll tell you in a second, the skin of shark is composed of very, mi very m minute teeth-like structures. The scales are like miniature teeth. So that if, you're, if you ever rub a shark the wrong way, literally, <laughs> and you get shark burn on you, you can tell people legitimately you've been bitten by a shark. This is another one. Oh, I don't know how you survived. <laughs> yeah, and this is another bite. This is uh, baby Samar got me, and this is the most embarrassing one. I was teaching some students, and I had this baby sandbar shark in my right hand, and I was pointing to it, and it just chopped right down. <laughs> it got really quiet for about two minutes, because nobody knew what to do. And, um, fortunately, I had a glove on, and, and it just, there was, I felt some pressure, and I had some just like paper cuts, so this animal couldn't have taken my finger off. Um, but when it tasted my blood, it let go. Uh, that should be very comforting to people who you know, are afraid of sharks, that, you know, that they have a distaste for it. Yeah, I tell people I never do dangerous things, but this was another picture of a student snapped at me with working with sharks trying to take the hook out. Um, let's briefly talk about shark bites, very briefly. Um, we know that shark bites are low likelihood events. Um, this is what a student wrote, and look at it very closely. She said, you're more likely to be struck by Lighting. Lighting. <laughs> well, I look like she's correct, so you all are far more dangerous in this room than you are in, Win in Winya Bay. Or in Shark attacks are low likelihood events. There's a hundred or so documented every year. It's probably an, an under um, estimate. There's probably more than a hundred every year. A lot of them occur in places where they don't report them. This is from the International Shark Attack file of the Florida Museum of Natural History maintains. Only a handful of them are, fa are fatal. Um, I unfortunately was quoted um, as saying that you're more likely to be struck by a falling coconut. And a student had told me that and I told a reporter that and I said don't print it, which here's a lesson for you. Don't tell a reporter something and then say don't print it. Um, they, they, went, they got to be um, viral. Um, and then some, some other person started saying it so I'm not, no longer quoted there. Um, and there's no international falling coconut database, so we don't know what that's <laughs> Alright, so let's look at some characteristics of sharks. So what makes a shark a shark? Well, sharks are fish. A scientist doesn't say fish and sharks. We'd say bony fish and sharks, but fish are aquatic vertebrates with gills and fins. So um, sharks are easily identifiable, identifiable because they have five to seven gill slits on either side. And the close relatives, the, the batoids, which are skates and rays, have them on the underside. And they are very close rela closely related, having diverged about 250 million years ago from each other, but still they're each other's closest relatives. Bony fish have a single gill, gill cover called an operculum. Sharks have a skeleton composed of cartilage, which is very flexible, it's strong. Um, it's also somewhat watery, so we don't know a lot about shark evolution because um, cartilage doesn't preserve very well. Ironically, among the most common vertebrate fo uh, fossils is sharks' teeth, because they are more mineralized. Okay. Now, are you saying sharks don't have bones? So they, they, have, they have a skeleton, but it's not made of the same, the same calcified bones that you have. So this, these are, this is the skeleton of a shark. They don't have ribs. You can see there's no ribs there. Oh. Um, this is the skeleton of a bony fish. They have a very, very simple skull. A bony fish has dozens of parts composing its skull. So one of the common features of sharks is they, the heads are pretty much all similar, minor variations. If you think of, of you know, watching any documentaries with bony fish, and just look at coral reef fishes, there's hundreds of different variants in their mouth parts and their head shapes. Sharks in evolution don't, don't have that, um, didn't have that luxury. The other big shark characteristic is the tail fin, the caudal fin. The upper lobe is longer than the lower lobe in almost all cases. One of the things this does is kind of interesting is it, it provides thrust, but because it's at an angle like that, if this is the head on this side, or point right here, it provides thrust in a diagonal direction upwards, which if you think of your seesaw physics, which should put the head down. And what prevents that is primarily the pectoral fins of a shark, those two fins on the side, and the, the way the head is 
is, in some cases, um, a plane in head, so that keeps the head from being pushed down. So the longer the tail, the broader the pectoral fins. Sharks also, all sharks use internal fertilization. Now most bony fish don't. Most bony fish, the female lays the eggs, the male will come, deposits sperm on the eggs outside of the female. All sharks and rays use internal fertilization using these claspers. They turn them around 180 degrees, serve it to the female. They actually flush seawater in with sperm to the female uh, reproductive tract. You also know, I'm sure, that sharks have multiple rows of teeth. Um, one of the reasons that shark teeth are among the most uh, common vertebrate fossils. And they're loosely embedded. And as I told you, they have these scales called dermal denticles, placoid scales, but they're basically miniature teeth that have a hydrodynamic function so that they help, they enable a shark to swim through water, minimizing the drag. And then many sharks have what's called a nictitating membrane. So white sharks, you know, protect their eyes by rotating them back in their socket and explode, ex, um, exposing the sclera, the white part of their eye. Um, a shark called a six keel shark, which you may be unfamiliar with, will actually suck its eyes using muscles attached to its eyes back into its socket. But most of the sharks you're familiar with um, will have this scale-covered eyelid that will be deployed when a shark is eating or when it feels threatened. That's a scene you probably don't want to see. This is in the Bahamas, but this is a tiger shark that has covered its eye with, it, with its entertaining membrane. Um, a little bit about some facts about sharks that you might not know. Um, most sharks aren't what you envision sharks to be. Most are small. Of the 500 and so species of sharks, most of them are less than about this big. Only about 50 species, fewer than 50 species, get to be about nine and a half, ten feet long. So when you think of a shark, a typical shark is small and brown and living in the deep sea and not jaws. So most sharks live on the bottom or right above the bottom, benthic or benthopelagic, we'd say. Fewer of them are the ones in the water column, again, that we think of all the time. And most sharks are deep water. Deep water is more than about 650 feet deep. So more species are there. This is a un relatively unexplored area. And if there's going to be new species of sharks discovered, they're not going to be along our coastline. Uh, they're going to be in the deep sea. And the most, most, are, most of the sharks are dogfish or cat sharks. Again, we have dogfish here, but not very many. Um, and and not, not many cat sharks. OK, so um, here's your first test. You may recognize this from Garden City Beach. Why is that not a shark? Yeah, not enough gill flips. Rows of teeth. Yep, rows of teeth. Um, the pectoral fins are very wimpy. They should be a little bit bigger. And then the second graders will always say, well, it's cemented into a parking lot. <laughs> Some people mention the eye. And the eye is probably not, um, it, that eye doesn't go with that shark. But the pupil shapes in eye and sharks are very variable. So they, there are sharks that have eyes with the pupil shape like that. All right, let's talk a little bit about shark research at Coastal Carolina University. Um, first of all, why would you want to study sharks uh, to begin with? Well, um, most sharks play very important roles in their ecosystem. Now, we think of sharks as apex predators, and many of them are apex being at the top of the food chain with no other natural predators. We know that's not even true anymore because in South Africa, there are a lot, in Australia, there are cases of orcas eating white sharks. So we know that white sharks aren't the, you know, the scary beasts that we, um, we presume them to be. But they, when they are apex predators, they are thought to control the population levels of animals below them in, in the food web. Um, and also their evolution right, by el eliminating the weaker animals. This is more theory than really known. Not, not many people have studied this, but it's probably true. Um, so um, sharks have economic value. And there's a case uh, for ecotourism that if you go to the Caribbean, for example, or Hawaii, some of these places, to swim with sharks, that you have a huge economic, positive economic value on, um, on the local economy. Um, I don't like you know, using this as a reason that we should study sharks, but some people do. I think they have intrinsic value. I think they're part of biodiversity, they're part of 
life a part of nature and we should respect and value them simply because of what they are and also because of you know how cool they are. <laughs> Threats to sharks, there's finning, there's commercial fishing, uh, recreational fishing. We used to think that there's no way that going out in your little john boat was going to affect populations of sharks. And in many areas, it's probably true they're not. But now, as more and more people begin doing that, especially with big sport fishing boats, and they don't release them, or even when they do release them, because now we know that many of the sharks that are released don't make it. Uh, it's called post-release mortality. Uh, that recreational fishing does have some impact. Uh, commercial fishing, there's targeted fishing for sharks. Not much in, in, in uh, this part of the coast anymore. It used to be more, but not, not much uh, directed anymore. But also for bykill. And the bykill is also called bycatch. So when you eat mahi mahi or tuna that's been caught in a long line, some sharks have died. Okay. Uh, for canned tuna, especially. Uh, canned tuna is caught, the smaller skipjack tuna primarily, um, that are caught in nets that are fished around what are called fish aggregating devices. So these huge floating objects that will bring fish in. And when the nets scoop up the fish, they scoop up a lot of threat other species like sharks and billfish and sea turtles. And, and so when you eat dolphin safe tuna, you're not killing dolphins, but you're killing sharks. Um, Finning is the big thing. Finning refers to illegally removing the fins of sharks for largely for the Asian shark fin uh, industry. It's an interesting thing going on there. I think I'll show you some pictures in a second. But there's a balance now because celebrating rites of passage with shark fins, a shark fin soup, um, is long established in many Asian cultures. Um, but as people now are entering the middle class, there's more education. And so many people are not doing it because of that. But also, more people are entering the middle class, and as a rite of passage, more people are beginning to do it. So there's a balance between the force that's reducing the demand and increasing. Habitat destruction uh, used to be people filled in wetlands, uh, coastal wetlands around here, particularly salt marshes. We don't do that anymore. But in the Bahamas, where I do my work, uh, the Hilton Cor Corporation just destroyed acres and acres and acres of mangrove habitat that was a uh, nursery grounds for baby lemon sharks. Uh, marine pollution, we're, I can tell you more about plastics. And we, one of our studies is looking at plastics in sharks in Winyah Bay. Yeah, we're finding plastics in the, in, in the guts. And then the game changer for everything is climate change. I'm not going to talk much about it except to say that there's no controversy among scientists. It's happening. Um, it's caused largely by burning fossil fuels, deforestation, making cement, um, just by our use of, you know, of the lifestyle we live, but it's warming the ocean, it's making more acidic, and it's, it's, a, it's a scary thing for us. Pictures of some of the shark fins. I took these two in Hong Kong. So sharks are vulnerable because of their life history character characteristics. They're slow growing. So one of the sharks that used to be most common right here is a sandbar shark. And a shark this big is only seven or eight years old. Um, a shark sexually mature is like 15. So to get to be that size takes a long, long, long time. And there's a lot of threats to keeping an animal from growing, from, you know, from reaching that. They mature late in life. So 15 or 16 years, again, before that sandbar shark is able to have pups. Relatively small litters. Um, so some sharks have as few as one or two offspring. Um, some seven or eight, some like the blue shark can have as many as 30, but many of them are quite small. They have a long reproductive cycle. Some, um, some are pregnant for a year, two years. In fact, it's thought that some sharks may be pregnant for two and a half years. So it takes a long time to reestablish that population. They often have specific mating in nursery areas. So think of, of Winya Bay. Sharks are coming back to reside in Winya Bay right now. Winya Bay is in pretty good shape, but things that can happen in its watershed, maybe too much fresh water coming in from climate change, um, may change that. It may mean that the sharks that come back here to uh, have offspring are in their early life history stages to reside there may not be able to. And they're highly migratory, so it means that Protecting them in one place doesn't protect them necessarily because they have to go back and forth. But they don't respect international boundaries or state boundaries. Sharks go where they want to go. 
Um, let me tell you a little bit about the CCU Shark Project in the remaining few minutes, and then about 10 minutes I'll, just, I'll answer some questions. Uh, we wanted to study the ecology of sharks in these waters. Um, that nobody had done it before. The South Carolina Department of Natural History does a, <coughs> um, natural resources rather, does a survey, uh, but um, not much in, they, they, they sample in Winyah Bay, but not, um, not systematically. So we want to know which sharks are here, do they pop in South Carolina waters, which habitats do they prefer? So Winyah Bay, about 13 miles long or so, um, we have as many as 10 different sharks or 11 different sharks at the same time in the bay. And it's not just like a vegetable soup. I mean, they find their own little places. And the, the, so we want to know what characteristics of the environment were important to which sharks. And then how do humans affect shark populations in South Carolina? We've done a number of other studies. that We've looked at magnets as shark repellents. Um, we've looked at piers as shark attractants. So we, we, we have listening stations on piers, and we put little pingers on the sharks, and we know that certain black tips like to stay around piers. Um, it's something, again, if you're a fisher, this is like, duh, I mean, you know, sharks are attracted to piers. Um, but are they attracted because you're fishing? Are they attracted because people are cutting or are cleaning the, the, the uh, fish they catch? Or because of the structure of the piers attracting other fish? Uh, probably all of the above. We looked at the behavior of sharks, we discovered that um, baby lemon sharks can recognize each other. Who, you know, who knew that sharks could, could, you know, could recognize each other? We looked at deep sea sharks, migrations of juvenile sandbar sharks. We know we're studying sharks that are overwintering now in Winyah Bay because most of our sharks, almost all of them, leave and come back. So when the water temperature dips below 70, most of the sharks that are summer sharks are gone. And then we've got spiny dogfish and dusky smoothhounds coming in to stay here during the winter. Looked at plastics. Um, I've got a student now looking at the big sharks in Winyah Bay, the lemons and bulls. And now we can, it took us a while to figure out how to catch them. Turns out they like to eat sharks. So we get sharks that have died on other people's gear, and then we use those for bait, and we're catching uh, bulls and lemons left and right. And then human impact in Merle's Inlet. Uh, Marl's Inlet used to have a very rich shark farm. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. Um, something about Marl's Inlet is uh, removing most of or preventing the sharks from coming in. And that's another area that we, we, we may focus on. This Winyah Bay, um, so is Georgetown here, the bridge is coming into Georgetown, Waccamaw Rivers. One of the biggest sharks we caught was at Fraser Point right here. We caught about a 10 foot lemon shark there. Um, but we set our long lines. Um, near Skinner Island right here, and the lower bird right there. This is Marl's Inlet and North Inlet, sampled there. They make great uh, comparisons because they're very similar to each other except with respect to human impact. Right? North Inlet is mainly pristine except for parts of it, and uh, Marl's Inlet is heavily human impacted throughout. Some of the areas in which we set our lines, our fleet of boats, although we just got rid of this one, and you may have seen the other boat that uh, Coastal just acquired that's not really useful to us for shark work right, right now. These are the long lines I've been talking about. So there, it's uh, about 450 feet, uh, just nylon rope, sometimes covered in tar. And then these are the branches that are called gangens with hooks on the end. Sometimes we set floats on the long lines. We use circle hooks, which uh, are better for the animals. They have a higher catch rate, but they tend to catch the angle of the jaw, and they don't swallow them. So the shark are much healthier for the sharks. There's one of my former undergraduates putting a tag in an animal. We've got a tail noose on. It's a sandbar shark. Sandbar sharks are just so much fun to work with. Uh, unless you do something stupid like stick your finger in your mouth, they, they don't try to bite you. <laughs> Okay, this one, let's, this one should come up in a second. Okay. So this, uh, thank you. We took the College of Charleston I, um, frequently, one of my old professors, and this shows some of the long lines, some of the smaller sharks we do. So as a float comes up, an anchor will come up next. This is sped up a little bit. And then we pull in our sharks. This, uh, this is a particularly good long line. Uh, where we're fishing there, we're catching a lot of, these are six to seven, eight-year-old sandbar sharks. So they're easy to work with. Um, they're not sexually mature. They're animals that are 
finding refuge is plenty of food, and they're away from a lot of the bigger sharks, although now we know there's still a lot of big sharks in there, but the safety in numbers in that, in that area. So we'll pull them in. There's a slightly bigger one. In a second, you'll see us pull a big ray in. Now, we don't pull the rays on board, and it's not because we're afraid of getting stung. It's because their jaws are very loosely connected in their, in their skull, and, and basically at the rear, and not on the sides of the front. So if you pull a big ray on board by a rope, it's like, kind of like pulling you up by your tongue. It's not a very uh, satisfying thing to do. So it's some more sharks coming on board. show you the rake. The rays and, and the red drum, we've been catching some huge red drum. Those of you who fish for red drum would be envious. We get 50, 60 pounders all the time. Um, we throw, tag and throw them back. But, so there's a ray coming up. You'll see, we'll, we'll just, we're just going to cut the leader and the, the hook will rust out of its mouth. Here's some of the sharks we catch. I'll, when I finish this list, uh, I'll take some questions and I'll still play some of the slides because there's a few more things to show you. This is the Atlantic shark nose shark. A, a small fish-eating shark, um, or a, a crustacean-eating shark that picks things up off the bottom. Um, very small teeth. If you fish around here starting in early spring, um, they're ubiquitous and they bother you because they're the beautiful little sharks. They have black tips on the fins. People think they're little black tip sharks with their Atlantic shark nose. They, you can identify that by the second dorsal fin is black and they have little white spots on them. There's that one. My favorite shark in the world is the sandbar shark, Carcharhinus plumbius. It's got this big, beautiful dorsal fin, and it's got a ridge between the first and second dorsal fin. So if you catch something with a slightly elevated ridge in our waters, that's likely what it is. Um, and they've been overfished, and they're not supposed to recover for maybe 40 or 50 more years, but they aren't being overfished anymore. They're, they are recovering. They do well on long lines. They've never been implicated in biting anybody. Beautiful animal, just a pretty color, big dorsal fin. Uh, they call them brown sharks other places. Black tip sharks um, are notorious around here because they're, they're bite first, ask questions later sharks. They will swim really fast. You'll see them going into bait balls. Um, they, they also corkscrew out of the water. It's not just spinner sharks that do that. Uh, they have black tips on their fins. They don't have that ridge. And that's the anal fin right there. And the difference, one of the differences between a black tip and a spinner shark is that anal fin right there is black on the spinner shark, but not on the black tip. We catch fine tooth shark, which as the name implies, has very fine teeth. Bonnet head sharks, beautiful freckles on them. They're hammerhead shark is us working with them, putting a tag on them. There's lemon sharks. So lemon sharks can be distinguished by the two big dorsal fins right there and a slightly lemon in color. There you go, it's a lemon shark. We catch big lemons. We've got 10 and a half foot lemon sharks in the bay. This one there. We occasionally catch nurse sharks, which you think of more tropical species in Winyo Bay. These are juvenile scallop hammerheads that are uh, not uncommon. And then bull sharks, Carcharhinus lupus. This is one of the scary animals. This actually is a picture right here. But one of these is, is uh, actually one that I almost put the head off of one of my students in the Bahamas. Oh. She was leaning over the boat to take a picture. Uh, I was in another boat. I tried to tell her not to do it. And the bull shark saw her and turned towards. This is a nine foot bull shark. Fortunately, she had enough abdominal strength to lift out of the water, but like a second before the bull shark bit the boat over where she was. <laughs> There's a picture from uh, the bull shark in the, forth the forthcoming book that I told you about. We catch tiger sharks, not in the bay. This is just outside of the bay. Although this is one of my, two of my students, uh, former students. This is in Win This is, excuse me, in Bimini. But releasing a tiger shark. Beautiful animals. And then the winter mix of sharks are dusky smooth hounds, like shown right here, with a, an anal fin right here. These are small fish, that, small sharks that are. Mixed with the other kind of, of sharks I'll show in a second that can be used for the uh, fish and chips industry. And this is the spiny dogfish here. And you, they have little spines preceding the two dorsal fins. And I'm going 
running through these. This is some of the bycatch we catch that we release. Um, sea turtles, red drum, it's a gaff top sail catfish. We've catch some clams, we've got boots, tires, you name it. <laughs> and then sometimes we catch animals that are um, bitten from other animals. Simply showing you some of the work we did with magnets. This is a bonnet head shark. This is a sham magnet, so just a piece of iron, and this is a magnet. So you can see when they see the magnet, boom, they're repelled by it. This is my former graduate student, Craig O'Connell, did this work for his master's thesis. Um, if I had time, I'd tell you about a cool project we did looking at um, juvenile sandbar shark migrations. I'll tell you the upshot of it is, is that these sharks utilize Winyah Bay disproportionately to other areas, so it's, it's a refuge for them. And then when winter comes, they leave the bay and they go south. And this was previously unknown. Um, we did this using what's called acoustic telemetry, where we have a pinger that we insert in the shark, and when they come near the, the, the um, receiver, we can get a, a, a time stamp and a signature of that particular animal. And what we've shown basically, these are all the receivers up and down the East Coast. So we all co cooperate with each other. If somebody in New England gets one a ping from our animal, they let us know. If we get a ping from theirs, we let them know. And basically what we've shown here, let me show you right here, um, is that our animals will leave Winyah Bay and head south in the winter. And that was a, a migratory track not previously known for the most part. This was known. These are sandbar sharks from Long Island, Chesapeake Bay, Big Nursery, and they move south and north. And it looks like we have a separate migratory route here. The same species, but they have different route. And I think what I'll do now, I've got five or ten minutes for questions. I'll take some, and I'll show you just a little bit of some videos while we're doing this of, of the Bimini Biological Field Station. What you're seeing here is my students swimming with Caribbean reef sharks. Right now, they're on a a rope connected to a buoy, a polyball, and there, um, when we finish feeding the animals, we swim them. These are all oh, your crews. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the animals sometimes get aggressive after about 30, 40 oh. minutes when new ones start to come in, and then we just get out of the water. That's a good idea. That's a great idea. <laughs> Can I answer any questions? I went a little bit longer. Yes, There's been answer. a lot of people injured by dead sharks. <laughs> And did you report that as a shark attack? I, I, enough people have heard me say it that they probably have concluded that, but I'm one of the few people I know that has a number of wounds from dead sharks. Yeah. <laughs> when, when you had the slide about um, shark attacks, that's just when the, they bite you and they come back and bite you again, right? No. So, so the, shark, the shark attack file calls everything an attack. Okay. And it's it's an unprovoked attack. So if you're a fraternity member and you have a little bit too much to drink and you're in, in the Florida Keys and you see a shark down there and you think it's a good idea to jump on it and it bites you, that's not reported. Okay. What's reported is if you're just swimming and a shark bites you and it's not provoked by you're taking a meaningful action to entice it. Okay. That other was reported on the your immediate list. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yes, you then. Does Mary Louise still have a, an active transmitter? Oh, I don't know. I think, I, I, I don't know. I mean, they, they can last several years, and, but I haven't followed that very closely. You could probably get a line and see. Well, some of the dive, diving down in the river down there in Charleston, they brought me some huge sharp teeth. Yeah, the me those are the mega tooth teeth. Charleston is one of the meccas for those. They're several million years old. They're from, they're from, a, uh, ancestor that's actually more closely related to Mako sharks than to white sharks, but they're in the same general lineage as, as, as white sharks are. They're huge animals, yeah. How far up the rivers do they get? So that's a good question, and we're studying that right now. That there are only a few species of sharks that are able to tolerate fresh water. One of the things we found is that the baby sandbar sharks can tolerate about half strength seawater. So as you know, Winyah Bay has fresh water coming in from one side, <coughs> salt water from the other, it mixes. And so the ocean has a salinity of about 35. And that's where most sharks stay. About halfway down the bay, it can be as low as 10 or 11 on the bottom. And that's where some of these sandbar sharks stay. But the sharks you're referring to around here are bull sharks. And they can uh, easily penetrate into completely fresh water. And they can spend 
enormous amounts of time there. They have adaptations that enable them to withstand the stresses of being in an environment where their senses don't work as well. They have to spend more energy to make sure they have water balance in them. Um, but they are able to do that very successfully. So um, you're, you're, you know, I would say you're pretty safe whenever you're in the water, but don't think you're more safe in fresh water. Um, mm -hmm. The units connected to the ocean. You just have to have that. Yes. Ray, um, any advice for distance swimmers off Pauly's Island, and would you swim in when you when you bay yourself? <laughs> sure. Um, I think it, I think it's comforting. It should be comforting to know that the sharks are there, and to my knowledge, there hasn't been. Uh, major bite along our shoreline, pretty much ever. Um, and the, the advice, you know, I tell people when my students and I see sharks, we swim towards them. But everyone else should be prudent and just slowly get out of the water. Most of them are harmless. You have to worry more about mistaken identity. Nobody understands why occasionally a shark will, will bite like a bull shark, when there could be lots of them around and one this idea of the rogue shark, and I don't like that idea, but occasionally an individual or maybe a few will have some sort of environmental conditions, or maybe they were less fit and weren't able to eat as well, and they might be the ones that, that, you know, that interact with people. But, um, I, you know, again, the typical information that you give, the sharks are moving closer to shore dawn and dusk. So, you know, it's probably the best time to swim in terms of not having lots of people out there and not being run over by a boat. Um, but that would be my advice. And of course, the other advice, stay away from where people are fishing, stay away from piers. Um, yeah, we've seen them out there and yeah. swimming around us and they've never bitten us while we were swimming. No, so it, it's no and, 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 and you know, for an ocean to be healthy, it needs its sharks. So I would be concerned if you didn't see any. Yes. Two questions related to the, the scene you were showing us with the students in the water. Mm -hmm. um, were, the, were you doing that for something fun for the students to do, or is it really more? Is there is there like a teaching moment, or is there something yeah. that you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, that's a that's a better question than than you know than you might think it is because uh, the first time they're in the water, I tell them to be kids and just marvel at the, you know to, to to appreciate nature. You know, I'm a scientist, and I appreciate the adaptations that sharks have and how they're hard work. But sometimes, I want my students just to marvel at you know, the creation. And so I tell them to be kids first. Thereafter, I tell them, make sure, you know, look at how these animals are using their senses to zero in on the bait. Frequently, two sharks will approach the bait at the same time. When they do that, um, they start out with, they'll, they'll hear the bait, they'll see it with clear water, They'll smell it, but when they get close, it gets very confusing. The smell can no longer lead them to it. Remember, they're going to have those nictitating membranes go up. So they have, um, they have electroreceptors that can detect micro amp potential, micro potential difference, micro amp current, current flow. And they will um, open their mouths, and now the strongest electrical signals from each other, and they'll bite each other. They don't hurt each other, but that happens very rarely, but you see it sometimes. So, so I try to get them to appreciate it. But it's a controversial practice, the bathing, um, you know, shark. It's not really good in, um, I mean, on balance, I don't know whether I'd say it's good or bad. Um, if you can get people in the water with predators and, and they become ambassadors for them, um, on the other hand, they're conditioning these animals to come close to humans, to expect to be fed, they're disrupting their ecology. So, um, you know, we're, it, it, it's, a it's a tough call. Do you, you say they have electrical sensors? Are, are they the only animal in the world that has electrical sensors? No, there are, there are, there are others, but, um, but you know, that's the, there's some freshwater fish that communicate elect with, you know, Electricity, some rays can do that, but they, of course, they can use their senses, their electrical sense to do that. But not very many do. No, so some completely foreign to, to humans. Yes? You, you mentioned a couple of reasons for why study sharks. Uh, they were apex predators and ecotourism. What could you elaborate on? What, why else study sharks? Why is this so important? Okay, well, you know, elaborating on it, might require a little bit more science, but basically, 
uh, we're, we're living in times where the normal biodiversity of any system, which is the biodiversity that has been established without human input, is being threatened. And so population numbers are being reduced, and some of them are being artificially increased. There's something called a trophic cascade, where if I take, for example, all the big sharks out of the system, then I've removed all the pressure on that next feeding level down. And that might be uh, medium-sized sharks. And if there's no big sharks to eat the medium-sized sharks, then some of the medium-sized sharks might actually proliferate more. There's not any good evidence that that's happening. But if they did, if that did happen, then that would, the next feeding level down, the food that those middle sharks are eating, they, it would plummet because there's too many sharks. And when you do that, then you risk throwing the entire ecosystem in, into a state of imbalance. Now, the idea of ecosystem balance is not an easy one to discuss. Uh, but sharks play roles in nature similarly to um, you know, to, to, to crabs and, and shrimp and other organisms. Some sharks are called keystone predators, like in an arch, where that keystone holds the arch up. That might be the most important organism in the ecosystem, and if you remove that, that organism, then, you know, the, again, you introduce imbalance into it. And the other thing is those sharks that are apex predators, think of, think of like other apex predators, like the big cats of Asia and Africa. Um, any apex predator is going to be the fewest, num have the fewest numbers in their ecosystem. And so they're more likely to be threatened by being removed. <coughs> Let me show you one more and then I will, you know, worship. Let's, let's just look at, um, let's look at this one. Can you click this one? This, I think, is the most dangerous thing we do. It's going to take us about 30 seconds to get there. This is. Um, place we call Honeymoon Harbor in Bimini, and we do a, a, a snorkel in a coral, really soft coral reef, and the second you'll see us go to where we feed stingrays. And they're very aggressive towards us, but not in a threatening way. They come up and they envelop you. Uh, they have crushing jaws. They tell my students when they feed them, let your fingers linger, and you feel the power of the crushing jaws. But I, I fear that one of my students might fall because when you see in a second, um, you see that the barbs are intact on these animals. I didn't choose this music. So. <laughs> Any other questions while we're doing What about the gray population here? Is it diminishing or is it... The so gray population seems to be doing well. We, 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 we basically, anti-stingray and pressure waters. And then the southern stingray is the big one. And then the blunt goes offshore and the man in the air should be sure as well. So uh, they tend to be doing okay. Um, make sure if you would like to pick up one of these, uh, I'll put some more of these out if you want them. These are just a little, um, it's going to be a poster that my former graduate student um, did on Sharks of Winnie Bay. She will ultimately uh, have a t-shirt available if anybody wants to order one. Um, and then we've got one with that logo on it as well that we're going to try to get back online sometime soon. Apparently, the words Coastal Carolina now are trademarked by Coastal Carolina. So if you ever try to use those words, you won't be able to. You'll, you'll just have to pay a license to be Coastal Carolina. Um, but we've done this without doing it. So we're, we're going to change it to CCU Shark. CC when you have a shark project. All right, so I think I've gone over, so I will stop here. Thank you very much. Dan, thank you.